In 1971, a diesel engine rolled off the International Harvester production line that would eventually power millions of miles across America. But before it became a legend, it nearly destroyed the company's reputation. This is the story of how one engine went from a farmer's nightmare to a mechanic's dream and what it teaches us about the cost of rushing innovation. Picture this. You're a farmer in Iowa, spring of 1974. Your brand new IH tractor equipped with the latest turbocharged DT-466 just died in the middle of planting season, again. The dealer says it's the third crankshaft failure this month. You've got 800 acres to plant and a weather window that's closing fast. And your neighbor, he's still running strong with his older naturally aspirated IH diesel. What went wrong? The answer lies in a corporate decision made three years earlier when International Harvester's executives looked at sales charts and saw something terrifying. John Deere wasn't just selling tractors anymore. They were selling a vision of the future. Bigger farms, fewer workers, and machines powerful enough to make it all possible. Their 6030 series had crossed a threshold that mattered. 175 horsepower in the world of american agriculture that number wasn't just a specification it was a statement international harvester had two choices accept a smaller market share in the premium segment or fight back with everything they had they chose to fight and the weapon they selected was a modified version of their existing diesel platform the 466 cubic inch engine that had served them well in naturally aspirated form but this time, they'd bolt on a turbocharger and chase the horsepower numbers that farmers were starting to demand. What happened next reveals something crucial about engineering under pressure. When you take a reliable design and ask it to do more than it was originally built for, you don't just add stress to the components. You expose every assumption that went into the original design. And in the case of the early turbocharged DT-466, those assumptions came back to haunt International Harvester in ways that would take nearly a decade to fully understand. The problem started showing up almost immediately, but not in the test facilities. In the field, under real-world conditions that no lab could fully replicate, farmers reported engines that ran hot, even with coolant systems that checked out fine on paper, crankshafts that developed stress fractures at points where the engineering drawings showed adequate strength, bearings that wore out in a fraction of their expected service life. And perhaps most frustrating of all, these failures seemed random. One farmer would run a turbocharged DT-466 for years without major issues. His neighbor, working similar acres under similar conditions, would be on his third rebuild before the warranty expired. The randomness wasn't actually random. It was a symptom of an engine operating too close to its design limits. When you tune a diesel for maximum output, you create a situation where small variations in manufacturing tolerances, maintenance practices, or operating conditions can push individual engines over the edge. One engine might have slightly tighter bearing clearances from the factory. Another might be operated by a farmer who believed in letting it warm up thoroughly before putting it under load. These tiny differences, which would have been invisible in a conservatively rated engine, became the difference between reliability and catastrophe in the early turbocharged versions. Let's break down what was actually happening inside these engines. The crankshaft issues weren't a matter of weak materials. International Harvester had decades of experience building heavy-duty diesels, and they knew how to forge a crank. The problem was stress concentration. When you add a turbocharger to an existing engine design, you're not just adding horsepower. You're fundamentally changing the force dynamics throughout the entire rotating assembly. Each power stroke hits harder. The instantaneous loads spike higher, and those forces concentrate at specific points. The fillet radius where the rod journal meets the crank cheek, the transition areas near the main bearing surfaces. In the naturally aspirated version of the 466, these stress points were adequate. Add 40% more cylinder pressure from turbocharging, and suddenly, those same transition areas become fracture initiation sites. Metal fatigue doesn't happen all at once. It starts with microscopic cracks that propagate over thousands of cycles. Some engines failed at 500 hours. Others made it to 2,000. The variance depended on factors that had nothing to do with how the farmer used the tractor and everything to do with tiny metallurgical variations and load histories that were essentially impossible to predict. 
The Bering failures told a similar story, but with a different villain, heat. Turbocharging doesn't just increase power, it increases the thermal load on every component in the system. The oil that lubricates the bearings is doing double duty, reducing friction and carrying away heat. When you push more power through the same displacement, you're asking that oil to handle significantly more thermal energy. The early DT-466 turbos used the same oil cooling capacity as the naturally aspirated versions. It wasn't enough. What happens when bearing oil gets too hot? The viscosity drops. The protective film between the bearing surface and the crankshaft journal gets thinner. Eventually, you get metal-to-metal -metal contact. Once that happens, the bearing material begins to break down. First, you see discoloration, then scoring, then catastrophic failure. And because oil temperature varies with load and ambient conditions, these failures appeared inconsistent. An engine working moderate acres in Minnesota might run fine. The same engine pulling heavy implements through clay soil in Missouri could destroy its bearings in a single season. But here's what makes this story more complex than simple engineering oversight. International Harvester wasn't ignorant of these issues. Internal documents from the period show that engineers raised concerns about thermal management and stress concentrations during development. But those concerns ran headlong into market reality. Every month, IH delayed introducing a competitive high-horsepower tractor was a month that John Deere solidified its position in the premium market. Every quarter without a turbocharged offering was a quarter of lost revenue in the fastest-growing segment of agriculture. So IH made a calculated decision. They would launch with the turbocharged DT-466, monitor field performance closely, and address issues as they arose. In theory, this could have worked. In practice, it underestimated how quickly reputation damage spreads in agricultural communities and how long it takes to engineer proper solutions once a product is already in the field. Here's where the story gets interesting. While International Harvester's corporate response was slow and defensive, something else was happening out in the field. Independent mechanics, dealer service departments, and even some farmers themselves began experimenting with modifications. They weren't waiting for official service bulletins. They were problem-solving in real time, driven by the simple fact that these engines needed to work and International Harvester wasn't moving fast enough to help them. Some of these field modifications were surprisingly sophisticated. Mechanics began installing aftermarket intercoolers, recognizing that the intake air temperature was causing thermal stress that the original cooling system couldn't handle. The physics here are straightforward. Cooler air is denser air. Denser air means more oxygen per combustion cycle, which means more complete burning and lower peak temperatures. By dropping intake temperatures from 300 degrees Fahrenheit down to 150 or even 120 degrees, these intercooler installations reduced thermal stress throughout the engine. It wasn't a complete fix, but it helped. Others focused on the oiling system, adding external oil coolers or modifying the oil galleries to improve flow to the most critical bearing surfaces. Some innovative shops even began tracking exhaust gas temperatures with pyrometers, giving farmers a real-time window into what was happening inside the combustion chamber. If EGT started climbing above safe thresholds, the operator could back off before damage occurred. It was preventive maintenance through instrumentation, something that should have been standard equipment from the factory. There were crankshaft reinforcement techniques, too. Some machine shops developed procedures for shot peening the fillet areas a process that induced compressive stress in the surface layer and made crack propagation less likely. Others experimented with different crankshaft coatings or even custom forgings with larger radius transitions. These weren't cheap fixes, and they certainly weren't what farmers expected to need on a new tractor. But for operators who depended on these machines for their livelihoods, spending an extra thousand dollars on modifications was better than losing a week of productivity to a breakdown during harvest. The fuel delivery system became another target for modification. Farmers and mechanics discovered that backing off the fuel rack slightly, reducing maximum fuel flow by just 5 to 10 percent, 
often resulted in dramatically improved reliability. Yes, you lost a bit of peak horsepower, but you gained consistency and longevity. And for most real-world farming operations, having a tractor that made 165 reliable horsepower was far more valuable than one that made 180 horsepower for 500 hours before needing a rebuild. These weren't official fixes, they were survival adaptations, and they worked well enough that some farmers who had sworn off International Harvester after their early experiences began to reconsider, not because IH had earned back their trust, but because the aftermarket had essentially finished the engineering job that IH had rushed through. This ecosystem of field modifications became a sort of parallel R&D department, testing solutions in real-world conditions and sharing what worked through informal networks of mechanics and farm equipment forums. By the late 1970s, International Harvester finally began incorporating some of these lessons into factory production. The changes weren't dramatic enough to warrant a complete redesign or a new model number. Instead, they rolled out incremental improvements, stronger crankshaft forgings with better radius transitions at stress points, improved bearing materials, better oil cooling, more conservative fuel delivery calibrations that sacrificed a few horsepower for significantly better longevity. The real breakthrough came with the DT-466B series, introduced around 1980. This version represented everything International Harvester should have done from the beginning. The engineering team had finally been given the time and resources to properly validate the turbocharged design. The cylinder head received a comprehensive redesign with strengthened valve bridges and improved coolant flow passages. The cooling system was upgraded to handle the increased thermal load with a larger water pump, revised thermostat housing, and expanded water jackets throughout the block. The oiling system was reworked to deliver consistent lubrication under high-stress conditions with improved oil gallery design and better flow to the main bearings. But perhaps the most important change wasn't visible on any technical drawing. It was a philosophy shift. Instead of tuning the engine for maximum peak horsepower, IH tuned it for optimal reliability across the full operating range. The fuel delivery was calibrated to provide strong power while maintaining adequate safety margins. The boost pressure was set conservatively. The result was an engine that might have made 5 or 10 horsepower less on a dyno sheet, but delivered that power consistently over tens of thousands of hours. The crankshaft received particular attention. The forging process was refined to ensure more consistent grain structure. The fillet radii at stress concentration points were increased. The entire rotating assembly was balanced to tighter tolerances. And critically, the main bearings were upgraded to materials that could handle higher temperatures and loads. These weren't revolutionary changes individually, but collectively, they transformed the engine's durability profile. The transformation was remarkable. Engines that had once been notorious for premature failures began racking up impressive service records. Fleet operators reported DT-466B engines running 15,000 hours or more before needing major work. That's roughly equivalent to 300,000 miles in a truck application or multiple growing seasons in agricultural equipment without opening up the bottom end. School bus mechanics who tend to be brutally honest about engine reliability because they depend on it every single day began recommending the DT-466B without reservation. These were the same shops that had dealt with early turbo failures and had long memories about what those problems cost them in downtime and warranty labor. Truck drivers who had avoided international harvester products after bad experiences in the 1970s found themselves surprised by how well the improved versions performed. The engine delivered strong torque at low RPMS, which made it fuel efficient and easy on the drivetrain. It started reliably in cold weather, a crucial factor for northern operations. And when service was needed, the engine's design made it straightforward to work on. Wet sleeves meant that cylinder reconditioning didn't require machine work on the block itself. The modular design allowed components to be replaced individually rather than requiring complete teardowns. By the mid-1980s, the DT-466 had effectively rewritten its own story. The oil field services industry adopted it for well service trucks that needed to run continuously in harsh conditions. Municipal fleets chose it for garbage trucks and utility vehicles that faced constant stop-and-go operation. 
Agricultural customers who had initially been burned by the early versions gradually returned as the engine's improved reputation spread through dealer networks and farming communities. What's striking about this turnaround isn't just the technical improvements. It's what those improvements reveal about the original problems. None of the fixes that made the DT-466B reliable were revolutionary. They were straightforward engineering solutions, better materials, improved cooling, more conservative tuning, proper validation testing. The kind of work that should have been done before the first turbocharged version ever reached a customer. So why didn't that happen? The answer takes us back to 1971 and the competitive pressure that International Harvester was feeling. In the race to match John Deere's horsepower numbers, IH made a calculated bet. They believed they could take an existing design, add forced induction, and get it to market before the competition completely dominated the high horsepower segment. They were probably right about the timeline. What they underestimated was the cost of getting it wrong. That cost wasn't just measured in warranty claims and lost sales, though those were significant. The real damage was to trust. In agricultural communities, reputation matters more than advertising. When a farmer has a bad experience with equipment during a critical season, that story spreads. When three farmers in the same county have similar problems, that becomes the local reality, regardless of what the company says in its marketing materials. International Harvester learned this lesson the hard way. The irony is that the DT-466 platform was fundamentally sound. The basic architecture, the cast iron block, the wet sleeve design, the seven main bearings. These were all solid engineering decisions. The engine had the bones to be great. What it lacked in its early turbocharged form was the refinement and validation needed to make forced induction work reliably over the long term. Today, the DT-466 is remembered as one of the most durable medium-duty diesel engines ever produced. Engines from the 1980s and 1990s are still running in trucks, buses, and equipment across the country. Mechanics praise its serviceability. Owners appreciate its fuel efficiency and longevity. The engine that nearly ruined International Harvester's reputation became one of their greatest success stories. But that success came at a price. The early turbocharged versions taught an entire generation of farmers to be skeptical of International Harvester's claims about performance and reliability. Some of them never came back to the brand, even after the problems were fixed. And for International Harvester, which was already struggling with financial challenges by the early 1980s, that loss of customer loyalty contributed to pressures that would eventually break the company apart. The lesson here extends beyond one engine or one company. It's about what happens when market pressure forces engineering compromises that aren't fully tested or understood. In the race to compete, International Harvester created a product that was technically impressive on paper, but insufficiently developed for real-world conditions. They launched it anyway, banking on their reputation to carry them through the inevitable problems. Instead, those problems damaged the reputation itself. The redemption of the DT-466 proves that good engineering eventually wins, but it also demonstrates that getting it right at the first time matters. The farmers who lost time and money on early turbocharged DT-466 failures didn't get those seasons back. The dealers who spent countless hours on warranty repairs didn't recover that goodwill easily. And International Harvester, despite eventually fixing the problems, never fully recovered the market position they had held before the horsepower wars began. In the end, the DT-466 became legendary not because of what International Harvester did right from the start, but because they eventually listened to the people who actually used the engine, the mechanics who modified it, the farmers who understood its limits, the engineers who finally got the time and support to do the job properly. That's when the DT-466 transformed from a rushed response to market pressure into something genuinely excellent. And that transformation is perhaps the most important part of this story.